Good day, Black Knight Scholars. Mr. Deegan here with another edition of VidNotes videos. Today we're going to start the third unit of World History 2, and that unit is the Age of Exploration. So please get out your VidNotes packet, and we're going to be taking notes on page two and three of that packet today. We've previously talked about the Renaissance and the Protestant Reformation. In those units, we've talked about the open-mindedness of Europeans. They become more tolerant of religions. They become more open to new pieces of art and literature and ideas. And this unit, we're going to be talking about the physical world and how Europe opens its mind to other cultures in other locations. So the major question we're going to answer for this lesson is, how did European exploration change the world? Here we go. Why do Europeans explore in the first place? Why not stay in their bubble and remain happy there. Well, one event sparked exploration for the Europeans. That was in 1453, the Ottoman Turks take over the key city of Constantinople. If you look down at this map in the red box is where Constantinople is. It's in present day Turkey. Constantinople was a capital city of the Holy Roman Empire, but when the Ottoman Turks, led by this man on the white horse, his name is Mehmet II, or Mehmet the Conqueror, when they come into Constantinople and take it over, the European economies lose a key trade route to Asia. Before Mehmet II and the Ottoman Turks take over, the Europeans have a land route directly to Asia. But the land route is taken away, and as a result, European nations now seek maritime or sea trade routes using the Atlantic. Now, European countries, you see Europe just north of Africa here, they go to the Western Hemisphere to explore North and South America. What motivated European exploration aside from this trade route being taken away from them? We're gonna explore the three G's now, three words starting with the letter G that act as symbols. Gold, first European merchants hope to profit from European demand for Asian spices and foreign natural resources. Second, God. The diffusion and spread of Christianity was important for Europeans. European rulers felt it was their duty to continue the Crusades, these holy wars between Christians and Muslims, and to convert indigenous or native peoples around the world to Christianity. The third motivational factor was glory. In other words, competition among nations to establish worldwide empires and set up trading companies that would make the economies of these nations rich and ultimately win them glory. The three G's, gold, God, and glory. Innovations that made maritime navigation possible. Without these, the explorers of Europe would not have done their job as well. A little backstory here. In the Middle Ages in Europe, navigation was considered one of the seven mechanic arts. The others were war, agriculture, performing arts, medicine, hunting, and blacksmithing. So when you were deciding on a career in Europe, in the Middle Ages, you might consider one of these seven. However, Europeans knew very little of the world outside of Europe. So navigation was a very new career path. And in fact, Europeans borrowed many of their ideas and innovations from Asia and especially from the Arab Muslims of North Africa and the Middle East. 
In fact, the Arab Muslims had the most academically advanced societies in the world in the 1500s. We get a lot of our ideas from science and math from the Arab Muslim societies and cultures in the 1500s. Let's go through some specific navigation innovations. The compass. Maybe you all have clutched a compass. The compass actually comes to us from ancient China, and it was originally used by the Chinese in fortune telling and also in feng shui to help decorate and organize a room. And the Chinese found a special form of metal called magnetite that if suspended from a string would always point in the same northern direction. This idea of the compass spread to the Middle East and Europe with the explorer Genghis Khan in the 1300s. And the very first compass looked like this picture below. It was a magnetite spoon on a bronze plate. And now our compass looks very different. In fact, you might say the modern compass is the GPS that we have on our smartphones. Other innovations, Latin sails, a ship, and an instrument that measures where you are in the seas. The Latin sails, they were reintroduced to the Mediterranean Sea and the areas around that sea by Arab sailors from the Indian Ocean. Those Arab Muslims, again, are playing a role. And the Latin sails are triangular sails, as you see by this model. And they are superior to the square sails. Why? Because they allow you to sail into the wind. You don't have to rely on whether the wind is in your favor. You can go in any kind of weather if you are a sailor. And Latin sails were put on ships called caravels. If you were a European explorer, you most likely had a caravel ship that looked like this. In addition to Latin sails, the astrolabe was an important innovation. It was first invented way back in the second century BC, before Christ, by the Greek Hipparchus. He was considered the father of trigonometry, a kind of math. Later, the Muslims came up with a thousand uses for this tool, among them astronomy and timekeeping. European explorers used it to measure latitude, where they were in the ocean. They lined up this instrument to the sun at noon, and they were able to chart, based on the sun's position from the horizon, where they were. We talk about navigational tools. There was an early navigation pioneer that was instrumental for the Europeans. His name was Prince Henry the Navigator. And here he is. He is a member of royalty. He's from Portugal and he's the son of the King of Portugal. So as a result, he has a lot of money. And he becomes a patron for navigation. A patron, meaning someone who funds and pays for the expeditions that sailors make along the coast of West Africa. And if we go from the second bullet point to this map, you see Lisbon, a major city in Portugal, and you see this red line which shows you the different routes that Prince Henry's sailors took along the west coast of Africa. And they eventually reached Liberia around the time of Prince Henry's death. Now, Prince Henry, before he died, also started a school for explorers in Portugal. He funded the school, he organized the curriculum, and it was very, very important for those early explorers because there really was no official school where explorers could learn their craft. Prince Henry, the Navigator of Portugal. Here are some of the graduates of Prince Henry, the Navigator's school. One of them explored the coast of West Africa. Bartholomew Diaz was the first to reach the tip of Africa in the south. Vasco da Gama 
an important Portuguese man, discovered a sea route to Asia. We'll talk about him in a minute. And Pedro Cabral, he discovered Brazil in South America. Gil Ines, he brought the first boatload of 200 slaves to Portugal. I just mentioned Vasco da Gama. Well, here he is in all of his sailing glory. He sailed for Portugal. He was a member of the school of Prince Henry's, and he sailed 27,000 miles for 10 months from Portugal to India with four ships, and he reached India in 1498. Let's look at the lower left-hand corner here and look more closely at da Gama's voyage. He left Lisbon, Portugal, and he and his men go around Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope, and stop in eastern coast cities in Africa, and eventually reach the city of Calcutta in India. And this marks Europe's first direct maritime route to Asia. And after da Gama gets back and shares his stories, it starts a scramble to set up Asian trade posts. He proves maritime trade with Asia is possible. Christopher Columbus, he is born in Italy, but he is hired by Spain. The Spanish monarchs, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, finance his voyage in 1492. And in that voyage, he reaches islands in the Caribbean Sea, but he thinks he reaches the East Indies in Asia. He actually lives his whole life thinking he has reached Asia not knowing he's discovered a new world, but not a direct sea route to Asia. Christopher Columbus's journeys fueled the Spanish-Portuguese overseas competition. Once the Portuguese see Columbus bringing all these riches to Spain, they want a piece of that glory, and competition ensues. Here are the four voyages of Christopher Columbus. You see, he did not go to India or Asia, but instead sailed around Cuba and Jamaica and the Bahamas. And this area is now Haiti and the Dominican Republic. So he sailed all around the Caribbean. Ferdinand Magellan, another man who sailed for Spain. Magellan was born in Portugal, but he led a Spanish expedition that was the first to circumnavigate or travel around the earth. That's his accomplishment to navigation. However, he didn't make it all the way around the world. He died in the Philippines in Asia, defending a Christian tribe he befriended against its enemy. He got caught up in a civil war in the Philippines. So, in 1522, one ship with 18 men returned home to Spain. Now, the journey had started in 1519 with 237 men aboard. So, it's successful, but there was a large price to pay for the first circumnavigation. Let's look at Magellan's route. He starts in Spain, and this dark red route shows you that he goes around South America. He hits spots along the Eastern coast and then travels further west along the Pacific Ocean and then hits Southeast Asia. And this square shows us a zoomed in area of where he dies. This cross shows you where Magellan dies. 16 months after Magellan dies, his crew finishes the job. They go into the Indian Ocean, they sail around Africa and the Cape of Good Hope, and return to Spain victorious. Spain also hires conquerors. They're called the Spanish conquistadors. King Ferdinand of Spain wanted to build a larger empire than Portugal because Portugal was empire building in Asia. 
So King Ferdinand of Spain hires two captains to lead expeditions in North and South America. Here are these two captains. First, Hernando Cortez. He leads an expedition in Mexico. Next, Francisco Pizarro. He leads an expedition to Peru on the west coast of South America. First, Cortez encounters indigenous natives in Mexico, the Aztecs. He claims central Mexico for Spain, but then he learns of the wealth of this local Aztec empire. Cortez and his men meet with the Aztec emperor Montezuma, who thinks that Cortez is a god the first time they meet. And I'm going to focus now on this painting that shows the first meeting between Cortez and Montezuma. So Montezuma gives Cortez a large supply of the gold that the empire has. Cortez and his men later take Montezuma hostage after Cortez learns that the Aztecs have attacked the Spanish. Now, there's misunderstanding. Who started this violence? Was it the Aztec or was it Cortez's men? That is left up to the judges of history. We do know that many of the Aztecs die of smallpox and measles because these are diseases they have no immunity for. Their bodies have never encountered it before. So they are weakened and the Aztec empire is weakened. So in 1521, Cortez and his men take over the Aztec empire in Mexico. The second Spanish conquistador, Francisco Pizarro, he encounters the Inca empire, people who are indigenous to the western part of South America. I'm going to move us to this map of South America. You see the lighter orange region? That is where the Inca empire lives. And in 1532, in Peru, Pizarro and a 200-man army meet the Incan ruler, Atahualpa. And Atahualpa brings an unarmed force of thousands. Many more men with no weapons. Pizarro's men end up ambushing the Incans. They then kidnap and kill Atahualpa. And this Painting shows you the kidnapping of Atwapa by Pizarro's men. In 1533, Pizarro and his men capture the Incan capital without a fight. And there is the Incan capital of Cuzco. Next, we travel to England to talk about its most famous explorer, Sir Francis Drake. Sir Francis Drake is a hero to the English. He is an enemy and a pirate to the Spanish. Why? Because Sir Francis Drake pirated Spanish treasure ships in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. It got so bad that King Philip II of Spain offered a $6.5 million reward to have Sir Francis Drake killed. Anyone who killed him would get this ransom money. It was that serious. Sir Francis Drake led an English expedition that was the second to circumnavigate or travel around the earth. Unlike Magellan, however, Drake survived the voyage. And that was his crowning achievement. When he gets back, he is knighted by the monarchs in England and Queen Elizabeth I, the daughter of King Henry VIII, names Drake the vice admiral in a war with the Spanish Armada, a war in which the English were victorious. Here is the route that Sir Francis Drake takes when he circumnavigates. He starts in England and his route is very similar to Magellan's. He goes around South America, travels and hugs the western coast of North America before going around the Pacific Ocean, hitting Southeast Asia, going into the Indian Ocean, around Africa, and back 
to England. From England to France, and France's most important explorer is Jacques Cartier. Here he is, looking out into the distance, stroking his beard. And he is important because he claims Canada for France. In doing so, he is the first European to travel inland in North America. He doesn't just hug the coast, he travels to the interior. He maps the St. Lawrence River in Canada. And he is a master captain and sea decision maker. Why? Because he makes three voyages without losing a single ship. And here you see his route. Let's look a little closer at where Cartier explores. So this is the northeast corner of North America. This is the state of Maine. And everything north is Canada. So Cartier explores the Gulf of St. Lawrence. He then goes down the St. Lawrence River and claims land, which is now Quebec City and Montreal, two important cities in Canada. And both of these cities have residents who speak French. Why? Because Cartier was French. All right, we are almost done with lesson one of unit three. Please fill out those summary questions. Next lesson, we're gonna be talking about the commercial revolution. What is that? Well, let's look at this diagram, colonizing countries like England, France, Spain, Portugal. They had colonies in foreign lands. They sent their manufactured goods to these colonies to be sold, and they would make money off of them. And they would also mine and use the raw materials they got, the wood, the iron, and they would bring the raw materials back to their factories, make manufactured goods out of the raw materials, and sell the goods to the colony again in this cycle. More on that next lesson. Until that lesson, this is Mr. Vegan signing off.